good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be. So today is going to be chapter two of As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. Hopefully the sound is okay because somebody's doing some lawn work in the area. And I got a couple buddies. Hello. <laughs> I got one there and the other's in front of me taking a pee. Want to say hi? I got my reading buddies. <laughs> it is terrific. All right, so I got I got chapter two of As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. Uh, let me get to it. First chapter was called Thoughts and Character. It was very short. Second chapter is Effect of Thought on Circumstances. Yeah, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. I mean, that really boils it down how this uh, law of attraction works. Effect of Thought on Circumstances. So here we go. This one will be a little bit longer than yesterday's. Let's put that piece of paper down. Bear with me. The human mind may be likened to a garden, which may be intelligently cultivated or allowed to run wild. But whether cultivated or neglect neglected, it must and will bring forth, which is capitalized, bring forth. So I'm getting that as regardless, your mind will bring you something. So whatever you put into it, those circumstances that match those thoughts, those thought vibrations, it's on the way. If no useful seeds are put into it, then an abundance of useless weed seeds will fall, accumulate, and will reproduce their own kind. Make sense? Just as the gardener cultivates the plot, keeping it free from weeds, and cultivating the flowers and fruits which are required, so may we tend the garden of our mind. Weeding out all the wrong, useless, and impure thoughts and cultivating toward perfection the flowers and fruits of right, useful, and pure thoughts. By pursuing this process, we sooner or later discover that we are the master gardener of our souls. Kind of like that. Master gardener of our souls. The, dire the director of our lives. This lesson also reveals within ourselves the laws of thought and enables us to understand with ever increasing accuracy how the thought forces and mind elements operate in the shaping of our character, circumstances, and destiny. Thought and character are one, and as character can manifest and discover itself only through environment and circumstance, the outer conditions of our life will always be found to be harmoniously related to our inner state. This does not mean that our circumstances at any given time are an indication of our entire character, but that those circumstances are so intimately connected with some vital thought element within ourselves that for the time being, they are indispensable to our development. Each of us is where we are by the law of our being. The thoughts which we have built into our character have brought us there. In the, in the arrangement of our life, there is no element of chance. I can get how it might appear that way, and the more that I've done this training, it's not by chance. We just can't explain how. Not by chance. It just unexplainable as to how it occurred but all is the result of a law which cannot err this is just as true of those who feel quote out of harmony with their surroundings as of those who are contented with them as progressive and evolving beings we are where we are that we may learn that we may grow and as we learn the spiritual lesson which any circumstance contains for us it passes away and gives place to other circumstances. 
We are buffeted by circumstances so long as we believe ourselves to be the creature, creature of outside conditions. But when we realize that we are a creative power and that we may command, as in your wishes, your command, the hidden soil and seeds of our being out of which circumstances arise, we then become the rightful master of ourselves. That circumstances grow out of thought, each of us who has for any length of time practiced self-control and self-purification knows, for we will have noticed that the alteration in our circumstances has been in exact ratio with our altered mental conditions. So tying directly in with what's going on outside you is a direct, exact ratio uh, correlation with our mental state, mental condition is the word he used. So true is this that when we earnestly apply ourselves to remedy, remedy the defects in our character and make swift and marked progress, we pass rapidly through a succession of vicissitudes. I gotta look that one up. Vicissitudes. The soul attracts that which it secretly harbors, that which it loves, and also that which it fears. It reaches the height of its cherished aspirations. It falls to the level of its basest desires. And circumstances are the means by which the soul receives its own. So to me that means the circumstances that you experience in your life is just, it's just feedback of what your, your thought vibrations are. Every thought seed sown or allowed to fall into the mind Oh, I like that. That's almost like whatever you allow to be around you that might influence your thoughts. Every thought seed sown or allowed to fall into the mind and to take root there produces its own blossoming sooner or later into action and bearing its own harvest of opportunity and circumstance. Good thoughts bear good fruit. Bad thoughts, bad fruit pretty straightforward the outer world of circumstance shapes itself to the inner world of thought and both pleasant and unpleasant external conditions are factors which make for the ultimate good of the individual as the reaper of our own harvest we learn both by suffering and bliss hmm. following the inmost desires aspirations Thoughts by which we allow ourselves to be dominated, and then in parentheses, pursuing the frivolities of impure imaginings, or steadfastly walking the highway of strong and high endeavor, end parentheses, we at last arrive at their fruition and fulfillment in the outer condition, conditions of our lives. The laws of growth and adjustment are naturally followed. One does not come to drunkenness or crime by the tyranny of fate or circumstance, but by the pathway, this is a narrow pathway in my opinion, but by the pathway of groveling thoughts and base desires. Thoughts and desires, you could maybe call those feelings. Nor does a pure-minded person fall suddenly into crime by stress of any mere external force. The criminal thought had long been secretly fostered in the heart, and the hour of opportunity revealed its gathered power. And the hour of opportunity revealed its gathered power. Sorry about that. No such conditions can exist as descending into vice and its attendant sufferings apart from vicious inclinations or ascending into virtue in its pure happiness without the continued cultivation of virtuous aspirations. That makes me think you get or become what you think about most of the time. Whatever you do repeatedly, you are and what you are, you get. Very straightforward as for how it works and is it easy to change, that's a different conversation. Therefore, as the Lord and Master of Thoughts, we are the makers of ourselves, the shaper and author of our environment. Even at birth, the soul comes to its own. 
and through every step of its earthly pilgrimage, it attracts those combinations of conditions which reveal itself, which are the reflections of its own purity and impurity, its strength and weakness. We do not attract that which we want, but that which we are. Want was italicized and are is italicized. Our whims, fancies, and ambitions are thwarted at every step, but our innermost thoughts and desires are fed with our own food, be it foul or clean. The, div the divinity that shapes our ends is in ourselves. To me, it just says we're responsible for our circumstance. It is our very self. We are manacled only by ourselves. Thought and action are the jailers of fate. They imprison, being base. They are also the angels of freedom. They liberate, being noble. Not what we wish and pray for do we get, but what we justly earn. <laughs> I use an asterisk and underline that and highlighted that. Not what we wish and pray for do we get, but what we justly earn. I spoke with somebody else today about the aspect of deserving or earning certain circumstance. Our wishes and prayers are gratified and answered only when they harmonize with our thoughts and actions. So thoughts and actions being in sync. That's a cool sentence. In the light of truth, what then is the meaning of fighting against circumstances? It means that we are continually revolting against any effect without, while all the time we are nourishing and preserving its cause in our heart. That cause may take the form of a conscious vice or an unconscious weakness but whatever it is it stubbornly impedes the efforts of its possessor and hence calls aloud for remedy all of us are anxious to improve our circumstances but are unwilling to improve ourselves so to me that's people saying well i want things to be different i want things to be different and yet they're not willing to change their thoughts or take the action so that they would deserve or earn the circumstances they they desire we therefore remain bound people who do not shrink from self crucifixion can never fail to accomplish the object upon which their hearts are set that sounds like focus to me this is true of earthly as of heavenly things even those whose sole object is to acquire wealth must be prepared to make great personal sacrifices before they can accomplish this object. Again, referencing earning something. And how much more so for those people who would realize a strong and well-poised life. For example, let's look at a man who is wretchedly poor. He is extremely anxious that his surroundings and home comforts should be improved. Yet all the time he shirks his work and believes himself justified in trying to deceive his employer on the ground of the insufficiency of his wages. Such a man does not understand the simplest rudiments of these principles, which are the basis of true prosperity, and is not only totally unfitted to rise out of his wretchedness, but is actually attracting to himself a still deeper wretchedness by dwelling in and acting out indolent deceptive and negative thoughts i'm pretty sure indolent means lazy so it says he's basically attracting what he has because he's staying where he's at with his thoughts he's not willing to change and if you want things in your life to change dot 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 i'll let you finish the rest now let's look at a rich woman who is the victim of a painful and persistent disease as a result of gluttony she is willing to, to give large sums of money to get rid of it, but will not sacrifice her gluttonous desires. She wants to gratify her taste for rich and unnatural foods and have her health as well. Such a woman is totally unfit to have health because she has not yet learned the first principles of a healthy life. Another example is an employer of labor who adopts crooked measures 
to avoid paying the regulation wage and in the hope of making larger profits, cuts the wages of his employees. Such a man is altogether unfitted for prosperity, and when he finds himself bankrupt, both as regards to reputation and riches, he blames circumstances, not knowing that he is the sole author of his condition. He's just saying you're the creator of your life and you're responsible for your results. You're not necessarily, in my opinion, good or bad. You're just responsible for the results that you have. And if you're responsible for where you are, you can be responsible and have more power to create something else. I have introduced these three cases merely as il illustrative of the truth that each person is the causer, though nearly always unconsciously, of his or her circumstances, and that, while perhaps aiming at a good end, that person is continually frustrating its accomplishment by encouraging thoughts and desires which cannot possibly harmonize with that end. So, from a certain person that's given a bunch of us training, if you're listening to this or watching this video, that's counter intention. If who you are as a vibrational being and what you want are not a match, you'll have internal counter intention and not achieve what you truly desire. Such cases could be multiplied and varied almost indefinitely, but this is not necessary. As you can trace the action of the laws of thought in your own mind and life, and until this is done, mere external facts cannot serve as a ground of reasoning. Circumstances, however, are so complicated, thought so deeply rooted, and the conditions of happiness vary so vastly with individuals that a person's entire soul condition cannot be judged by another from the external aspects of his or her life alone. Ooh, I like that. I was talking to somebody today and the topic came up to about success. And it was like, well, is success money? Is success you feel good, you have health, you mentally feel good. Like, what is success? And that's for each person to define. A person may be honest in certain directions, yet suffer privations. Maybe that means like lying or being deceptive of some sort. Another may be dishonest in certain situations, yet acquire wealth. The usual conclusion, however, is that the one person fails italicies because of his or her particular honesty end of italics and that the other prospers italics because of that person's particular dishonesty end of italics this is the result of a superficial judgment which assumes that the dishonest person is almost totally corrupt and the honest one is almost entirely virtuous in the light of a deeper knowledge and wider experience, such a judgment is found to be erroneous. Reminds me of Vince Vaughn in whatever movie. He was like, erroneous! Might have been Wedding Crashers. The dishonest person may have some admir admirable virtues, which the other does not possess. And the honest person, obnoxious vices, which are absent in the other. The honest person reaps the good results of honest thoughts and acts, but also is the cause of the sufferings which his or her vices produce. The dishonest person likewise garners suffering and happiness. It is pleasing to human vanity to believe that people suffer because of their virtues, but not until every sickly, bitter, and impure thought has been extirpated from their minds. I'm assuming that means removed. And every sinful stain washed from their soul can they be in a position to know and declare that the sufferings are the result of their good and not of their bad qualities. On the way to, yet long before that supreme perfection has been reached, such people will have experienced the great law, that's capitalized, great law, which is absolutely just and which cannot therefore give good for evil, evil for good. Possessed of such knowledge, they will then know looking back upon their past ignorance and blindness, that each of their lives is and always was justly ordered, and that all their past experiences, good and bad, 
were the equitable outworking of this evolving yet unevolved self. Good thoughts and actions can never produce bad results. Bad thoughts and actions can never produce good results. This is but saying that nothing can come from corn but corn, nothing from nettles but nettles. We understand this law in the natural world and work with it, but few understand it in the mental and moral world, though its operation there is just as simple and undeviating, and they therefore do not cooperate with it. Suffering is always, italicized, the effect of wrong thought in some direction. It is an indication that we are out of harmony with ourselves. With the, capitalized, law of life, we are out of harmony with ourselves, comma, with the law of life. The soul, S-O-L-E, is an only, the sole and supreme use of suffering is to purify, to burn out all that is useless and impure. Hmm. Sounds like burning off karma. Suffering ceases for those who are pure. There could be no object in the burning gold after the dross has been removed, and a perfectly pure and enlightened being could not suffer. The circumstances we encounter with suffering are the result of our own lack of mental harmony. The circumstances we encounter with blessedness are the result of our own mental harmony. Blessedness, not material possessions, is the measure of right thoughts. Wretchedness, not lack of material possessions, is the measure of wrong thought. I'm going to read that again. Blessedness, not material possessions, is the measure of right thought. Wretchedness, not lack of material possessions, is the measure of wrong thought. That really sums it up. Like, if you think well, you'll get well. If you think unwell, you'll have unwell. We may be cursed and rich. We may be blessed and poor. Blessedness and riches are joined together only when the riches are rightly and wisely used. Mm. And the poor person descends into wretchedness only when his or her lot is regarded as a burden unjustly imposed. Indigence and indulgence are the two extremes of wretchedness. They are both equally unnatural and the result of mental disorder. We are not rightly conditioned until we are happy, healthy, and prosperous. Happiness, health, and prosperity are the result of a harmonious adjustment of the inner with the outer of our relationship with our surroundings. And I have highlights and asterisks and underlines all over that paragraph. We begin to be mature adults only when we cease to whine and revile and commence the search for the hidden justice which regulates our lives. Ooh. Search for the hidden justice which regulates our lives. Think about that one. As we adapt our minds to that regulating factor, we cease to name others as the cause of our condition but begin to build ourselves up in strong and noble thoughts not being a victim we cease to kick against circumstances but begin to use them as aids to more rapid progress and as a means of discovering the hidden powers and possibilities within ourselves using circumstances as aids to more rapid progress so I get, look for the good, look for the gold, you know, something, quote, bad happened, pop the champagne, this is great. So using those circumstances to aid ourselves to more rapidly progress. Law, not confusion, is the dominating principle in the universe. Justice, not injustice, is the soul and substance of life. And righteousness, not corruption, is the molding and moving force in the spiritual government of the world. Ooh. <laughs> I have that underlined and uh, highlighted. Spiritual government of the world. I like that. This being so, we must right ourselves to find that the universe is right. And during the process of putting ourselves right, we will find that as our thoughts are altered toward things and other people, 
Things and other people will alter their thoughts toward us. Gee, that sounds like a certain type of the golden rule. Maybe the expanded golden rule. Maybe think about others the way you want them to think about you. Hmm. The proof of this truth is in every person, and it therefore admits of easy investigation by systematic introspection and self-analysis. I like that, self-analysis. Like if you know, if you really look, you'll, you'll know what's going on for you. Let us radically alter our thoughts and we'll be astonished at the rapid transformation it will affect in the material conditions of our lives. We may imagine that thought can be kept secret, but it cannot. <laughs> it rapidly crystallizes into habit and habit solidif solidifies into circumstance. Oof. We may imagine that thought can be kept secret, but it cannot. It rapidly crystallizes into habit, and habit solidifies into circumstance. So from thought to habit to circumstance. I would have that actually written on the next page. Bestial thoughts crystallize into habits of intoxication and consumption which solidify into circumstances of destitution and disease. Impure thoughts of every kind crystallize into enervating and confusing habits, which solidify into distracting and adverse circumstances. That's a nice way to put it, adverse circumstances. Thoughts of fear, doubt, and indecision crystallize into weak, soft, and irresolute habits which solidify into circumstances of failure, indigence, and slavish dependence. Lazy thoughts crystallize into habits of unseemliness and dishonesty, which solidify into circumstance of foulness and beggary. Hateful and condemn condemnatory thoughts crystallize into habits of accusation and violence, which solidify into circumstance of injury and persecution so it's repeating over and over in different ways with different thoughts thoughts lead to habits which lead to circumstance selfish thoughts of all kinds crystallize into habits of self-seeking which solidify into circumstances more or less distressing on the other hand beautiful thoughts of all kinds crystallize into habits of grace and kindliness which solidify into genial and sunny circumstances. Pure thoughts crystallize into habits of temperance and self-control, which solidify into circumstances of repose and peace. Thoughts of courage, self-reliance, and decision crystallize into strong habits, which solidify into circumstances of success, plenty, and freedom. Energet energetic thoughts crystallize into habits of cleanliness and industry, which solidify into circumstances of pleasantness. Gentle and forgiving thoughts crystallize into habits of gentleness, which solidify into protective and preservative circumstances. Loving and unselfish thoughts crystallize into habits of self-forgetfulness for others, which solidify into circumstances of sure and abiding prosperity and true riches. A particular train of thought persisted in, whether it is good or bad, cannot fail to produce its results on the character and circumstances. We cannot directly choose our circumstances, but we can choose our thoughts and so, indirectly yet, surely shape our circumstances. Listen to that one again. It pretty much sums it up. You get to become what you think about most of the time. Nature helps us to the gratification of encouraging thoughts and opportunities are presented, which will most speedily bring to the surface both the good and evil thoughts. Let us cease from our sinful thoughts and all the world will soften towards us, toward us and be ready to help us. Put away weak and sickly thoughts and opportunities will spring up on every hand to aid our strong resolves. I hope you can hear me okay over that that thing if not oh well <laughs> encourage good thoughts and no hard fate will drag us down to wretchedness and shame the world is our kaleidoscope and the varying combinations of colors 
which at every succeeding moment it presents to us are the exquisitely adjusted pictures of our every moving thoughts. You will be what you will to be. You will be what you will to be. Oof. Let failure find its false content. In that poor world environment, but spirit scorns it and is free. It masters time, it conquers space. It cows that boastful trickster chance and bids the tyrant circumstance uncrown and fill a servant's place. The human will, capitalized W, that force unseen, the offspring of a deathless soul, can hew a way to any goal, though walls of granite intervene. Be not impatient in delay, but wait as one who understands. When spirit rises in commands, the gods are ready to obey. And that last one, two, three, four paragraphs is attributed to Ella Wheeler Wilcox. That was a really good chapter. Can't really see the, the time, I don't know, it's 20 minutes or so. Really good one. I recommend you get the book, you read the book, let me know your thoughts on what I read. If you agree, you disagree, any insights, cognitions, any input. Love to hear what you think about it, how you feel about it. And um, I'll hopefully do chapter three tomorrow. I'm traveling tomorrow. Um, I'll do my best to get it done so uh, I can keep my consistency and my pattern going. Okay, everybody, hope you're well. Wish you the best.